Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's talk. We will get started momentarily after we give another minute or so for people to log on. We thank you very much for joining us. Okay, it looks like we have a critical mass, mass of people who've uh, been able to log into our webinar. Um, so I'm Nara Dillon and part of this um, Critical Issues Concerning China Lecture Series Committee, um, teaching in the government department here. And I'm very pleased to welcome Guo Bing Yang to speak in this series today. Um, Guobin is the Boggs Professor of Communication and Sociology at the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's the author of many excellent books, including The Power of the Internet in China, The Red Guard Generation and Political Activism in China. And now the book that he's going to speak about today, just off the presses, Wuhan Lockdown. Um, Professor Yang has two PhDs, which I find quite extraordinary, <laughs> a PhD in English literature and another PhD in sociology. And clearly he brings together all of these areas of expertise in his re research on the internet in activism and civil society in China. So I welcome Guo Bin Yang and we'll turn this over to him to speak about the Wuhan lockdown. Thank you, thank you, Nara, um, for your uh, very kind, generous introduction. Um, and uh, thank you um, also, and the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies for inviting me to talk about my new book. It's, I'm really excited. Uh, yesterday was the official release date of the book. So this is uh, such wonderful timing and I feel so honored. I would like to begin by thanking one very special person at Harvard who gave me tremendous support when I was working on this book, Professor Liz Perry. Uh, Liz read the entire manuscript and offered many detailed comments for revision. And all, you know, despite the hardships of uh, pandemic times. So I'm extremely grateful for her support. Um, and if I remember correctly, Liz liked chapter three on people's war. So I thought to be safe, I had better um, start with this chapter today. Um, the chapter uh, features stories of uh, yelling, shouting, broadcasting, and other very loud sounds. Um, but from the perspective of yin and yang, I would also like to compliment the loudness of chapter three by also sharing some stories from chapter four, which is quieter and is called Lockdown Diaries. Cosmological principles were not irrelevant in the war on COVID in China. The special hospitals, um, Fire God Mountain, Thunder God Mountain were given those names because in ancient Chinese cosmology and medicine, fire and thunder are associated with forces that vanquish diseases of the lungs. Um, so uh, those are the two chapters I will focus on, share stories from them. But before that, uh, let me say a few words about the goals of the book uh, in general. Um, the book as a whole uh, focuses on storytelling. Uh, Wuhan, as we all know, was the first city in the world to be locked down due to the COVID pandemic. And although many other cities in China and the world were also locked down later, no other city was sealed off as abruptly and as tightly as Wuhan and for as long. So it was a really unprecedented event in world history. The lives of 11 million residents in the city were changed overnight. 
uh, when I started writing this book, the event was still unfolding. No one knew when the lockdown would be lifted. There was a great deal of uncertainty. And later, um, when the pandemic hit uh, close home here in Philadelphia, other parts of the US, the story of Wuhan became entangled with US-China relations, mm -hmm. with global geopolitics, with anti-Asian racism and hate crimes, even in my own neighborhood. Those were the circumstances under which I worked on the book. And so when I started working on it, I wasn't sure a conventional academic study is up to the task of narrating such a weighty and complicated historical event. Um, I thought I would take a humbler approach, focusing on storytelling um, instead of uh, trying to theorize when the event was still unfolding. So the book as a whole follows a roughly chronological order, starting with the beginning of the lockdown on January 23rd, 2020, and ending roughly uh, with the end of the lockdown, April the 8th, uh, the same year. But the chapters are structured by theme. The main chapters, there are nine chapters altogether, and the main chapters cover China's media environment before 2020, citizen reactions to state mobilization of the war on COVID, citizens self-mobilization through personal writing, civic organizing, stories of medical professionals and patients, nationalism, collective memory, and so on. Um, so those are the main uh, themes covered in the chapters. Each chapter, presents a series of dramatic scenes. And these scenes are populated by various characters and their stories. Um, in order to make the stories understandable, I try to provide a good amount of uh, cultural and historical context. So uh, you know, the narrative uh, structure of the book is uh, built on these uh, three elements, scenes, characters, and context. Scenes uh, are dynamic moments of action in concrete settings. They are situational and contextual. People who behave in one way in one scene may behave differently when things change. I thought working on this, a focus on scenes might offer a productive way of capturing the dynamics and complexities of the lockdown experiences without running the risk of making hasty conclusions um, or giving you know, explanations. Characters uh, in the scenes are the people or performers um, you know, in that context. The Wuhan lockdown touched the lives of tens of millions of people. And one of my goals was to try to recreate the galaxy of characters in Wuhan and their multiple voices. So um, many of the scenes and characters are familiar to people who are following the events at the time, both in Chinese media and here in the English media, such as Dr. Li Wenliang's death, Fang Fang's story, Dr. Ai Fen's story, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so there are some well-known scenes and, and characters, but I also wrote about lesser, lesser known figures and scenes such as delivery drivers, COVID patients, and of course, diarists. Um, the historical drama of the Wuhan lockdown was made up of these scenes and characters. So uh, those are just a few broad uh, remarks about uh, the general goals and structure of the book. And I'll now turn to chapter three and chapter four to share some examples from them. The lockdown of uh, Wuhan inaugurated a people's war on COVID in China. The war metaphor has been used around the world in the fight against COVID. Um, but as we know, a people's war has its specific history in China. It was part of the language of the Cultural Revolution made famous by 
Lin Biao, uh, Marshal Lin Biao's speech called Long Live the Victory of People's War, which was published on the 20th anniversary of the end of the wall of resistance against uh, Japanese invasion. This language of people's war has never really quite disappeared from Chinese political discourse. Um, in recent years, for example, uh, wars have been declared on environmental pollution. But still the war on COVID is I think surely the biggest in scale since the Cultural Revolution. And one feature of this people's war on COVID uh, was this loudness. And there were lots of shouting, like, like I mentioned, but also yelling, crying, weeping, cursing, swearing, screaming, whistling, whistleblowing, clamoring, cheering, wailing, honking, howling, square dancing and singing, loudspeaker broadcasting, boombox broadcasting mobile automobile broadcasting, all these sounds. You know, I can feel sometimes, I can he still hear them, uh, even if uh, they happened um, two years ago. And where did these loud noises come from? They came from all places, shelter hospitals, streets, apartment buildings, you know, resi residential communities, it also came from social media, like Weibo, WeChat, Bilibili, you know, um, Douyin, and other video platforms. They came from both private and public spaces, and they were recorded and reported, sometimes in detail, in personal writings, uh, such as diaries. In some ways, making loud noise suited the circumstances when visual cues became less reliable for interpersonal communication, sound became particularly useful. If you couldn't recognize the person wearing face masks on the other side of the street, you could yell to check. If residents couldn't leave their homes, they could at least hear the loud broadcasting of COVID policies that came from the outside. At other times, these loud noises burst as if out of nowhere. And they were like flames of life burning through a plague. If you think about uh, all these noises happening almost on a daily basis. So chapter three has many loud scenes uh, with loud noises. Two main sources um, of, of this kind of noise was government propaganda and persuasion to tell residents to stay home. The other main source came from citizens who complained about some of the COVID policies. And I'll tell a couple of stories uh, from each source. In general, citizens showed overwhelming support um, for quarantine and stay at home policies. But there were pockets of non-compliance and resistance. And uh, so there were lots of government efforts to propagate and enforce these policies. All forms of media were used, loudspeakers, wall posters, social media, community staff members shouting directly to residents inside buildings, all in order to persuade residents to follow policies and stay home. The language used in delivering the messages was often quite blunt. And you will see when I later I'll read a couple of examples. Typically, the speakers tried to warn people that they would put their families at risk if they didn't follow the rules. It was a kind of moral persuasion, more than legalistic argument. Family safety was the ultimate consideration. So let me give one example here of uh, um, noise, voice, loudness from uh, gov the government perspective. This was the case of a village head in Henan province shouting over the loudspeaker to warn his villagers to stay home. Loudspeakers were a ubiquitous part of Chinese life in the Mao era. And uh, 
you know, Professor Li Jie has a wonderful article about this, which I, I found extremely useful when I was wor working on this chapter. So loudspeakers were used for political propaganda, campaign mobilization, labor discipline, many other things in the past. By the late 1970s, you know, this kind of networks of loudspeakers all had basically covered the, you know, most Chinese villages. But the arrival of TV in the 1980s, the television culture led to the decline of the use of loudspeakers. But in the you know, new national program of building a new socialist countryside, loudspeakers are reinvented and revived. With internet access, the old style wired networks have been transformed into digital and internet networks of loudspeakers. So in 2017, um, the, the state administration of press publication, radio, film, and television, that's a long name, but that's the name at that time, um, issued policies to build a national emergency broadcasting system. And the new campaign slogan was invented. It was it's still called Chun Sun Xiang. Let every village be wired with loudspeakers. This new digitalized loudspeaker infrastructure was activated after Wuhan was locked down. There were lots of audios and videos of rural leaders warning villagers to stay home. When they were posted and circulated on social media, it was as if they were being broadcast to the whole nation through the internet. So I quoted one viral speech in my book and I'm going to read it to give some sense of what these loud speeches were like. Um, so many of these speeches were shouted out and usually in very colorful dialects, uh, Henanese or Sichuan Hua. Um, I, you know, I can't uh, really reproduce that kind of effect. I'll just read, uh, read the text and give a sense. And this is on page 45, the village leader, village head, broadcasting over the loudspeaker. And here is what he said. Villagers, attention please. Villagers, attention please. I have something to say. What about? Based on my observations these days, I found our village has some problems. Many villagers have lots of problems. Let me tell you, tell you. First, I've been shouting over the loudspeakers for a few days. You all know our roads are closed. You are not allowed to visit relatives or other families. You are not allowed to run around. Yesterday, the whole day, many people were running around. Do you not fear death or are you morons? Just stay home, don't run around, don't visit anyone. Some people are playing mahjong or organizing mahjong parties at home. Do you really not fear death or is money more important? Don't you think I'm, don't you think I'm giving you an earful? If something bad happens to you, I tell you, you don't know where to go to cry. These days, the higher ups have very strict rules. All the rules prohibit you to visit relatives or others. So you just play mahjong if you can't visit relatives. I broadcast yesterday and the day before yesterday, but some people just wouldn't listen. They took this matter like a wind blowing past the year. So your families are all made of iron, all molded in steel. Your families have no fear. How can you be like this? You run around in the street and even organize mahjong parties. What are you up to? Don't, don't say I'm, not, I'm, I'm giving you an earful. Let me tell you, if something happens to you, it'll be too late to cry. So it's a relatively long passage, but the original uh, was in Henanese uh, uh, dialect and much you know, more powerful than my English translation. Um, so that's one example of the voice of village authority figure shouting to his villagers. And, and then let me just uh, turn to uh, citizens, citizen voices of counter yelling. Citizens who uh, voiced complaints and protests or simply cried out for help 
they were also very loud. And chapter three tells three stories and I will share one of them. And it's very well known one. It's uh, known as the story of the swearing Wuhan County. It happened in a period of the lockdown that was particularly difficult for, for the local residents. And that was mid-February. At that time, the city had just put all its residential communities under closed management, Fengbi Guanli, which basically prohibited residents from leaving home without a permit. Residents, um, they could get a permit to go out shopping every three days. Even so, grocery shopping was not easy. So on February 22nd, 2020, a WeChat audio file nicknamed, uh, a lot of these incidents were immediately given the nickname by people, you know, by the net, by China's netizens. So this one was nicknamed Wuhan Swearing County, Han Ma, Han Ma Da Sao, or simply the Wuhan Swearing, Han Ma. It went viral on social media. It was recording of anonymous Wuhan woman, vent, uh, Wuhan woman venting her anger on WeChat at a party secretary um, of a residence community and, um, and the manager of a neighborhood supermarket. She was angry that the residence committee uh, tried to shirk their responsibilities and that the supermarket took advantage of residents by selling bundled groceries to them. And uh, again, it's a, it's a relatively longish uh, passage. Um, let me see, it's on page 58 and 59. Now I'll read part of it, just again, to give it some sense. It's uh, even, more, even more forceful than the village uh, leader's uh, speech. You're bamboo bamboozling us. We just want to buy a bag of rice, but it has to be bundled with toilet paper, soy sauce, and stuff. Brute motherfuckers. If we complain, you will say, oh, you come and work as community volunteers. That's all you can say. What else can you do? What good have you done? Write it down. Let us take a look. Bullshit. Secretary Zhu, I'm glad you happen to be in this group, in this WeChat group. Let me tell you why I'm so angry today. From the time when this group was set up to now, I can tell you our homeowners association tried to contact your office numerous times. Not a single response from you. Yes, you work on the front line. It's true you are busy, but that's your job and we are doing our job. So that's the, that's the Wuhan auntie's swearing speech. Um, it was in Wuhanese, which, you know, difficult to understand. Uh, the versions that, uh, uh, fortunately, that I found online, it has uh, uh, subtitles uh, in standard, you know, Putonghua. So, you know, scholars of performance studies uh, have examined the cross-cultural image of the no-nonsense, unruly auntie figure, and it's even called critical auntie studies. So there's no doubt, I think, that the Wuhan swearing auntie is a contribution to critical auntie studies. But still, it was quite remarkable in its bold use of curse words, and it was extremely powerful in impact. Diarists, a lot of these uh, major incidents at the time, um, you know, diarists, when they wrote about their uh, daily activities, they would share their comments and reactions uh, to these events. This one, of course. Um, so uh, one diarist uh, wrote that the speech won applause on social media, and it had cathartic effects on the city in distress. So here is what the diarist wrote. The Wuhanese swearing of the Wuhan auntie stirred up your feelings like waterfalls pouring down high mountains. You showered thorough joy and gratification on so many Wuhan people. To be fair, she scapegoated community workers for the ineptitude of the government. All the resentment, of, all the resentment people had accumulated in their hearts poured out with the rhythmic rise and fall of the top grade Wuhanese swearing. So the Chinese is called Shiji Han Ma. It's the best Wuhanese swearing. 
Um, all right, um, let me now turn to a quieter chapter. So chapter four is about how residents coped with the lockdown by uh, chap chapter four, um, uh, which is called Lockdown Diaries. is about how residents uh, in Wuhan and other places coped with the lockdown by writing and sharing diaries. The diaries that collected were all posted on social media. Some had large numbers of readers and followers. Others had only dozens or hundreds of views. The diarists wrote about their emotions, their fears about the pandemic, the struggles of their daily lives. There were many quiet reflections and ruminations, as well as angry and outspoken comments on current affairs, um, some very you know, uh, harsh criticisms as well uh, of government officials. Some tried hard to seek inner peace and encourage themselves to persevere in times of difficulty. And these people, you know, the Taoists, they were thinking, pondering, wondering, counting the days, counting the cases every day. So these acts of feeling and thinking were accompanied by sounds. You know, these are some of the quiet sounds that you can read about. Uh, sometimes you can hear from the diaries, because they're audio diaries. Sounds of sighing, sobbing, crying, murmuring, smiling, lamenting, whispering, video chatting, puffing on a cigarette, silent mourning. And these diarists endured lots of self-doubt and a sense of powerlessness. Um, so I'll give you a few examples um, of how they try to cope and kind of quiet uh, ruminations and reflections they wrote about. Guo Jing felt that life was so upside down that keeping the daily journal of personal life might be too trivial. Initially, she hesitated about starting a diary. She did not wish to be seen as a miserable victim and did not feel she was among the most unfortunate. But then she also realized that that may be because she did not want to admit that she was a victim and that it took courage to recognize one's powerlessness. So she then pondered the meaning of keeping a diary from an activist perspective. She's a feminist activist. So in her own words, this is what she wrote in her diary, one of her entries. As a gender equality advocate, I know better than others that to solve a social problem, it's first necessary to tell it. I decided to try to keep a diary because I do need support now. Such self-reflections and ruminations were very common in the diaries. They often came with small, but sometimes very precious new awakenings, new understandings of the meaning you know, of self, of family relationships, a meaning of life. So one person wrote, wrote about her grocery shopping experience. And here's a quote. When I was shopping in the supermarket, I felt the presence of people around me. I thought to myself that all these people were there to provide support for their own families. I realized that the pandemic made me experience many feelings that I had never experienced before. And, you know, many diarists carried on extended self-dialogues with themselves to cheer themselves, you know, under these different circumstances. One person, Mr. Amber, let's call him, uh, is a self, very self-conscious diarist. He explained to himself in multiple entries repeatedly, just trying to justify to himself why he was keeping a diary. And he reminded himself again and again to persevere to the end of the lockdown, to write to the end of the lockdown. So on January 28th, the sixth day of the lockdown, he wrote that his original intention in keeping a diary was to document his and his family's life so that more people could understand Wuhan and the lives of its people. And he wrote uh, in his own words, my diaries are a running account 
but the records are true. Therefore, in my heart, I feel that my lockdown diary is meaningful, maybe meaningful only to myself. One day, when I look back from my old age, she'll be the grand historical record of part of my life. Grand historical record is a reference to Shi uh, Ji Sima Qian by Sima Qian. Tao Tao is the mother of a 12 year old son. She posted 76 diary entries the entire period of the lockdown. On February 26, she wrote about her effort to practice self discipline by paying her respects to the Japanese novelist Haruki Murakami. And this is what she wrote. For 20 years, for 20 years, Haruki Murakami persevered, getting up at five in the morning to start writing. For him, daily writing was like going to work. He would write for four to five hours. Nothing could stop him. He would run at least 10 kilometers every day. Every year, he would run at least one marathon. A person who can spend decades in exactly the same way, like one day, and do things every day in a carefully regimented way deserves a lot of respect. I have a special liking towards such people. A week after the lockdown, I began to pay respect to this kind of disciplined life. I no longer spend all my time eating, sleeping, and watching TV dramas. But Tauta was also ambivalent about what to write about in her diary. She kept some of her personal ruminations in a draft folder and never posted them. And she wrote, quote, there are many things I want to write about, dreams, love, and even my trivial everyday life. Some things I wrote first and then cut later. I want to be known but fear to be known. I want, to be, I want to be understood, but do not want to be controlled. There are secrets in my memos and self-murmuring in my draft folder. I'm open-hearted and frank, but I still fear being misunderstood. Um, so I, I could go on and share more stories of loudness and quietness like these, um, because other chapters in the book also uh, have uh, stories of this kind. But um, I think I'll pause here just to share um, a couple of my own thoughts, let's say quiet thoughts about these voices. And then um, I will stop uh, so we can have some uh, discussions and Q&A. The, the Italian philosopher and uh, feminist scholar, Adriana Cavarero, wrote the following words in her book entitled For More Than One Voice. She wrote, the voice is always for the ear. It's always relational. So I asked myself, of the voices you know, um, I wrote about in the book, and you know, like these I discussed about, whose ears were they for? who listened and who heard. I think they were meant for different years when these voices, um, when these people spoke out, you know. Some were for their friends and neighbors, some for government officials, um, some were not directed at any particular years but were almost like you know, desperate questions to heaven. It's almost like Qu Yuan's Tian Wen, right? Like we, there's other story about gong beating woman crying out for help on her balcony, not specifically at, at, at any particular person. It's almost like crying out to heaven. And some voices were for their own inner ears. They were, you know, and some of these were not even voices yet because like the story of Tao Tao, I mentioned uh, some of her self murmurings, she said, she just kept in her draft folder and never um, published them. They were just the personal vague ruminations. 
But no matter whose ears these voices were for, as long as they were shared on social media, they reached more ears than intended. And that's why so many voices filled Chinese social media during the lockdown, despite the presence of censorship. And these voices, I think, had an unintended social effect social impact in the sense that so many people were glued to cyberspace, to social media, reading these stories, listening to them. So there was a kind of emo emotional solidarity created through these voices. So in that sense, I think the constant um, voicing of uh, you know, personal emotions, sharing of stories in loud and quiet voices, created a source, a kind of social solidarity um, uh, you know, during, the, during the lockdown period. That was important, I think, uh, in the fight on COVID. We may also ask if the voice is always for the year and always relational, can we, say, can we ask, does the year seek out the voice whose ears seek out whose voices? I guess another way of saying this is, how do readers or listeners of the stories of Wuhan relate to the voices of those characters? We know that fiction readers may like or dislike some characters, love or, love or identify with one and feel attached or indifferent to another. Some characters may serve as models for education and behavior, others not so much. Perhaps characters in a nonfiction study um, could raise similar questions. The characters in the stories I've shared, written about in the book, pose questions about the moral meanings of their experiences. Many questions, such as, uh, just to mention a few, what would I have done? If I had been in Wuhan like them, would I have written and shared diaries or volunteered to help feed pets and do community work? These are in other stories. Or as self-disciplined as these residents were during the stay-at-home lives and so on and so forth. Many such stories we can ask. I don't have answers to these questions, because now the context has changed. It's hard to put myself back into that context. But I thought um, they're at least uh, worth asking. Um, I, I think I'll stop here. And um, I think I, I've pretty much used up my time. And I look forward to, to your questions and discussions. That's OK, Nara. Stop yes. here. Thank you for uh, a wonderful overview of some of the um, best stories in your, your book. And um, for the whole audience here, please feel free to put in your questions into the Q&A box. And uh, we'll uh, ask Professor Yang here to uh, answer your questions. But I'd like to start off just by asking a little bit um, about what you think about this moment of crisis and the, the beginning of this crisis, um, what you think it reveals about Chinese society at that moment. You know, when I read your book, <laughs> it struck me that we still don't know the ending to the story. We know that the lockdown came to an end, but we're still struggling through the pandemic. And I love your effort to try to capture the original feeling and the original sounds of this very first chapter of the story we're in. But it does seem to me that your book really reveals a lot of things about Chinese society as it existed in 2019 and in the very beginning of 2020. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts on what your research um, made you realize uh, about China at that moment that you may not have appreciated before. Thank you, Nara. That's a, that's a great question, really important question. Um, I think a 
pandemic, a plague, uh, you know, unprecedented crisis uh, like this one uh, in any place, um, here in the US as well, right? In every place reviews a lot um, about the society and its people and things that, um, things we've taken for granted um, and we suddenly have a new understanding like I think some of the um, um, diarists wrote about their um, personal reflections about meaning of life and the family. Um, I think uh, one of the uh, very striking uh, things about Wuhan Lock, I'm specifically talking about that 76 day period. Um, in, in moments like this, um, people, uh, so many people could uh, rise to the occasion, um, even at the risk of their own uh, lives and, uh, and their own families. That's something that, uh, you know, um, that's completely, uh, that, that's so moving. That's, that's also one of the uh, really uh, important reasons why I, I follow the event so closely and read the documents so, so closely. Uh, there are stories I, I, I didn't mention uh, here, but it's in the book, like a young you know, volunteers, a young, young man with a one child uh, uh, son at home and, and his wife, of course, uh, would uh, still go out uh, to volunteer as a driver to, to uh, deliver donations to frontline medical workers. Um, you know, knowing that uh, at that time, it's, it's difficult to imagine the kind of fears that people um, could have at that time. Now that two years has, has passed and we were not in ground zero, right? Um, that kind of spirit, I think is just so admirable. And uh, I think, uh, and then that, I guess that's one the, from, from the perspective of individuals, individuals, who can rise to the occasion, but also individuals can rise to the occasion as part of a collective that people can act together, um, united in ways that uh, that we're not able to do. We're not able to, to be united here in the US uh, to fight kind of uh, common virus. These are, are really, I think, um, striking to me. Yeah, this bottom up sense of solidarity, it's in such striking contrast to, to the US and it really presents a story not of some authoritarian government imposing this lockdown on a people, um, but people um, enacting this discipline um, together uh, and with a lot of criticism of the government, um, definitely not blind loyalty. Um, so it's a really complicated picture. We have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. So I'll highlight a few of them. Um, Elizabeth Perry says, thank you for a wonderful talk. The experience of speaking out during the cultural revolution is said to have had profound lasting effects on ordinary Chinese citizens' political attitudes. What long-term effects on ordinary people's political views do you think the noise of the lockdown may have? Thank you for being here, Liz. I'm so excited um, and uh, really important question. Um, um, it's, it's, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, I think, uh, I, I guess there are a couple of things I would say about what long-term effects on ordinary people's political views, the noise of the lockdown may have. Um, for one thing, I, uh, I hope I didn't uh, convey the impression that this kind of noise, you know, it's loud, you know, it's very critical, is, is, is so unusual. So in, in a sense, we've been hearing this kind of noise um, from time to time, it, almost all the time, um, uh, you know, for a long time, even though, uh, as we know, in the past decade also, there has been a lot of changes, transformation, uh, transformations of China's public sphere and cyberspace. Um, hushed noise uh, to a certain extent, um, but I, you know, it seems to me that um, it's very difficult to predict based on 
let's say the long, let's the ten year pattern of the retreat of civil society. I was uh, slightly surprised, but not so surprised that there is outburst of of noise and voice and and uh, this kind of activity. So I guess that's one uh, quick response. That is not. It's, it's, it's quite extraordinary because there was a great deal of censorship, but not so extraordinary in the sense that this has been happening uh, quite regularly. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, some of these uh, voices uh, are extraordinary. Um, for instance, Li Wenliang's um, famous uh, uh, you know, sentence when he was interviewed, you know, a healthy society needs to have multiple voices. Um, the story of Dr. Eiffel, uh, several of these well-known stories have almost become kind of, um, uh, almost entered into the, the, the lexicon of everyday discourse that become, people are, uh, are familiar with these stories and will cite these stories. And, and I, I, I saw this um, uh, mention of Dr. Li Wenliang's um, um, language in you know in recent uh, discussions. Whenever there is uh, whenever there are cases of censorship, um, difficulties of uh, voicing opinions, people now will be able to think of Li Wenliang's uh, warning. Um, the last quick point I would say is um, I think it's very difficult to predict uh, what a, you know a relatively short period of. Uh, of crisis and unprecedented behavior during this crisis will have longer term uh, effects on, you know, on the general public in the long run. And that's something that uh, I would certainly love to, to follow up. And uh, you know, um, I think, uh, I'm sure political scientists and sociologists could uh, uh, do um, interviews, uh, you know, um, um, years after this and to find out whether there are major um, uh, changes. Well, speaking about these multiple voices, we have a question from um, an anonymous member of the audience who asks about the woman who cried out in Wuhan, um, who later also criticized Fang Fang, who's probably the person we know most about. <laughs> from the lockdown. Um, and so this person asks uh, what you wrote about them in your book and how would you explain um, the, the contradictions among these voices? Thank you very much uh, for that question. And it's a, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, contradictions is, um, is something I want to um, represent that I think that's Part of life, um, so I'm not surprised at uh, surprised at this kind of contradictions. Uh, there are uh, there are ironies and contradictions, but this uh, indeed, as you mentioned, is one of the most striking, uh, even outrageous examples um, of uh, change of um, personal positioning. So I did I did talk about both uh, both. Uh, the context for both uh, occasions, the initial crying out for help of this, this incident is called, uh, again, dubbed by netizens as the gong beating woman who was uh, crying out for help on the balcony. And uh, Fang Fang, who already, who, who had you know, millions of uh, followers on Weibo was one of those who tweeted that cry for help. Um, you know, directly or indirectly, at least the people on Weibo and the netizens believe later on when the woman turned against Fang Fang, that Fang Fang actually had, had, had help, helped her because um, the day after uh, the woman um, made that uh, call for help, she and her mother were both uh, uh, hospitalized. Hospital. They were. They. They needed hospital beds, and hospital beds were very, very, very difficult to come by at the time. And they were able to. They were. They. They were able to be put in the hospital and uh, tested, treated, and um, later on they. They were happy. They. 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 They were both treated and uh, they recovered and left the hospital. Uh, so when, uh, when, when later on she turned against Fang Fang. Uh, 
people were arguing uh, that, you know, this is like um, and not grateful for the help that you received uh, from people like Feng Feng. Now you're attacking Feng Feng. So, but of course, the, the question here is why did she turn against Feng Feng? Um, I would I would say that um, this uh, the Fang Fang phenomenon, uh, Fang Fang herself, you, you might say, was a victim of a bigger um, uh, historical, uh, you know, a moment, and, and and that moment had to do with geopolitical factors, U.S. China relations. For for those of you who who I, I, I'm sure probably we all know the background, Fang Fang. Was it was you know initially attracted uh, huge uh, numbers of followings and everybody was in, were enthusiastic about her diaries, but later on when she um, her diary was translated and published in English, um, it was also it coincided with uh, coincided with the with the period when. Uh, the media rhetoric here, including politicians here in the U.S., um, were uh, attacking China and uh, even demanding reparations uh, from China. So under those circumstances, some of these uh, uh, people like the gong beating woman and other diaries, I also wrote about this in the chapter on nationalism, uh, turned against Fang Fang because their, their argument was that Fang Fang's diary, because Fang Fang's diary was very critical. Uh, kept pushing for you know uh, accountability of local government officials, uh, and they argue that well, Fang Fang story now uh, provided material, and their language was provided the ammunition, I think, to Western media. And that's the that's the context for 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 why the why the this woman turned against Fang Fang. There were other uh, there were other examples as well. Is very. Um, I don't know where I have. I should go into this. Uh, I think I'll stop here. I, I could go on. There are another exa other examples. I think it's um, it's part of this. Um, yeah, geopolitical, uh, transnational um, political discourse, the clash of discourses, you might say. Yeah, and that captures the fact that there's a, a an audience for all of this outside of uh, China as well, which is an interesting dynamic <laughs> in all of this. Um, to take a few more of our questions, we have a question from Tom Gold at UC Berkeley, who says, this is a fascinating cross-section of life in China at a critical time. Do you examine birth cohort differences or generational differences in reaction to the lockdown and government policy and how these different generations use media and language um, when they're taking to social media? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, Tom, for, for a, a great question. Um, I didn't examine um, birth cohort differences. Um, Partly because I think there seems to be a variety of um, um, different views. I, I think they're mixed enough. I couldn't uh, really draw conclusions about whether there are general patterns, differences between, um, let's say, the Cultural Revolution generation or the current so-called 1990s cohort. Um, so I didn't do that, but I did notice and uh, try to. Um, talk a little bit about one interesting phenomena, which is the uh, prominent role of women um, in, the peer, in the lockdown period. Uh, so I didn't mention that of the three major voices of criticism, including Wuhan auntie, the gun beating woman. And uh, there's another, you know, later on there are other incidents, Eifen, Dr. Eifen, and you know, the, the fake and fake, a lot of these voices, and of course, a lot of these diarists um, were women. I, uh, you know, I think that's, there's some, there's, there may be something interesting to say there. I, I couldn't uh, really draw any conclusions, except that I noticed that there are some interesting and differences here in terms of gender, women played an important role as volunteers, as activists, as uh, critics, you know, as diarists, and definitely as uh, medical professionals. Um, 
so that's I think um, is an interesting phenomenon, and that would be uh, would be an important topic for future study. May, I, I think cohort there could be differences, but I didn't um, uh, really examine that. Yeah, and the view of the feminists who were um, in particular trying to advance <laughs> the cause of women in this crisis, um, I think were particularly interesting in this, this context. Um, we also have a, a question from Jaru Jan, who's um, a visiting scholar here at the Fairbanks Center. Um, and says, I would like to ask what your, is your opinion about the long-term impact of these emotions that pass through social media and these strong and just miserable memories of the people in the Wuhan lockdown. I notice we're asking you a lot to think about the long-term consequences <laughs> of something that we're still in the middle of, but maybe you could think about, um, you know, just this period since the lockdown ended um, up until the, the present moment. Yeah, I think that will be a, another important topic uh, for future research. Um, in terms of longer term emotional impact, I think uh, there will be important, uh, serious uh, emotional uh, impact uh, for some people, for many people, traumatic uh, uh, memories of, the, of that period, you know, um, because there were death, you know, all, all these times of fears and so on. Um, um, I think, uh, you know, again, it's uh, at this point, we don't know um, um, in any concrete way, what kind of exactly how this kind of uh, emotional effects will be manifest in individuals. Um, you know, Harvard uh, uh, and, you know, Professors, anthropologists, Arthur Kleiman, uh, right, wrote at the end of the Cultural Revolution, I think early 90s, uh, 1990s, wrote about the uh, physiological impact of the of of the Cultural Revolution, and um, you know, even even decades uh, after the Cultural Revolution, the people who uh, suffered trauma in that period may still sometimes feel um, physiological pains, you know, dizziness, headaches, and those could, could be you know, the kind of lingering uh, effects there. I think what I try to do in the book is really one, I, I think uh, any his, major historic events, but certainly this one, we want to document uh, the experiences as much as possible for the sake of memory and remembering. And, uh, I think people will remember this uh, in, in various ways, in very, you know, for, again, for some people in traumatic tra trauma, for others, just a, it's a deep memory that uh, some people may not want to remember, but others cannot forget. And I have one example in the last chapter, which is about mourning and memory. That's the one year anniversary of the death of Li Wenliang. Li Wenliang died on February the 7th, 2020. So on um, February the 7th, 2021, one of the diarists in, in my book was uh, taking a taxi um, ride and, and they were going through the tunnel. And when they were going through the tunnel, the taxi driver, and they, had, they, had, they hadn't chatted you know, when, when, when this person went, on, uh, went into the, the car. Suddenly, you know, like out of nowhere, the taxi driver just sighed and said, Today is uh, is Xiaonian. It's, it's uh, you know um, again before before the Lunar New Year, and today is the one year anniversary of Li Wenliang. And I, I the diarist that diarist himself was extremely moved. I was very moved to read that. You know, it's like just out of nowhere, people suddenly just remembered and shared personal memory about the person who died one year ago. I think these kind of memories will be there, will last for a long time. Um, a lot of these materials on the website have disappeared and will disappear, but uh, people who experience the moment, uh, I think will remember this for a long time. And that's a kind of emotional impact as well. Well, and I think your, your 
book does a really good service to all of us of helping to document and bring back the feelings and the sensations <laughs> of that time. Um, and, you know, when, when you're living through that kind of a turning point in history, it raises all these strong emotions, um, particularly when it's something as frightening as a pandemic. But later on, we forget those feelings. Um, and, uh, and so in that sense, this book really reminded me of um, Craig Calhoun's book about the Tiananmen student movement, where he really tried to capture that feeling of what it was like um, to participate in this movement. And this book does the same thing for um, this first chapter of the pandemic. Well, I wanna raise a different question that a re reader um, asks about, which also addresses a big theme of the book. This, um, this member of the audience says, I'm curious about the rise of Chinese nationalism. When the epidemic caused while the epidemic caused enormous suffering, the Chinese people united and fought against it. They also fought against racism. Did the epidemic promote that solidarity and patriotism or what do you think explains this? Well, that's a, I wouldn't say that the, um, the panda pandemic promoted nationalism. I think uh, uh, it was really a radical reaction um, to the kind of anti-Chinese, um, anti-Asian Asian racism that was happening around the world. Uh, and again, I cited Darius who had personal experiences, um, their children or children's friends who were studying abroad in Europe, uh, as well as in the US, had experiences of uh, you know, uh, being um, victimized uh, during, the, during that wave. So I think this kind of direct personal inference, uh, direct personal experiences of uh, victimhood in that period, victimhood of racism, um, reveals a lot to people uh, in China about uh, about this cultural social atmosphere. Uh, I think it's it's one dimension of the outside world that. Uh, Chinese citizens uh, um, do not understand very well, do not know very well, but the pandemic uh, was a moment of revelation. Um, I think that, uh, I would say, helped explain a lot uh, the rise of very strong uh, nationalism uh, sentiments. Um, but, you know, it's, it's always complicated. And uh, I also discussed the historical echoes of, um, of repar whenever there are all these reparation claims were, were raised that brought back really, you know, long histories of, but, you know, uh, but very well known histories of um, um, humiliation for the Chinese um, uh, nationals. And that, uh, Sometimes we, we, we read in, in the media that, well, that's a long time ago, a century ago. Uh, why, can't you, why can't you forget about that? Well, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a profound uh, historical wound for the nation. And uh, of course, that, that history has been passed on from generation to generation in, um, in all kinds of cultural forms, right? Education, uh, literature, uh, arts, and so on. So I think um, all these work together um, to just make uh, uh, ordinary persons suddenly feel that, uh, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, never before have they realized that I'm Chinese now. For those who were, who were in China, if you don't travel outside of China, you don't you really think about your, your Chinese identity. But now this time, I think a lot of people did. And uh, another example I might, I might offer, just mention in that chapter is about, uh, again, so this is a um, older woman in, in the 70s, another aunt um, who, uh, 
who was you know when Darius wrote about this aunt, they they were they were very close friends. That this this aunt was like a mother figure to this person, and uh, and he had been sharing Fang Fang's diaries um, on WeChat, and she she you know she never said good or bad. Occasionally, she actually even even Tian uh, um liked uh, some of these postings, but. You know, after this wave of anti uh, Fang Fang um, online um, criticism started, uh, she sort of suddenly changed too. She began to call Fang Fang a traitor. That's the language that was used a lot uh, online. And it just puzzled the diarist. She just, he just couldn't understand how come you know, this motherly figure I know so well suddenly seems to have changed. So much, um, you know. I think uh, this. What uh, one thing I try to do is I try to, as much as possible to tell these stories, um, partly because I don't have a final explanation. I think it's it's the beginning. Uh, I think it's the beginning of trying to get some some better understanding. But these these stories are quite common. Um, in the in the personal writing, uh, and they come from ordinary, very ordinary people who who you really don't really like. I said, think of themselves as Chinese, uh, but now they suddenly they realize that they were Chinese. Yeah, well, this connects to another one of our questions here um, about Dr. Li Wenliang. Um, it says if you could talk a little bit more about his impact. And says in particular that Li Wenliang's words about a healthy society needing to have multiple voices um, is not new. This is a reiterating the importance of the freedom of speech. But could you say a little bit more about why his words became so popular? And just to connect to your last comment, it's particularly striking that both his words, Fang Fang and others um, who seem to be arguing for um, more liberalism in Chinese society. I'm wondering what you think their long-term impact will be after this Wuhan lockdown. I think uh, the, main, um, the main reason why uh, really uh, rather um, you know, um, not terribly surprising remark, uh, right? And completely understandable remark from Li Wenliang could become so influential, so powerful um, in that moment. And uh, I think it was because it was uh, spoken at that very moment. That you know there was uh, uh, there was a lot of censorship, but there was a lot of resentment um, and complaints, uh, such as Ying Fang Fang stories about why you know um, why the uh, local government authorities um, punished Dr. Li and several others, uh, right? Um, when they were really, they were not really strictly speaking, right, whistleblowers. They were just sharing some information with their friends and families. The only on direct, the only on denied that he was a whistleblower. He was just sharing some information. So I think there was a, a kind of outreach about about their situation, and it became even um, that. That sentiments became it just you know um, it it went up and down it went because all these all, every other day there is a major new incident uh, during in early March uh, when we, we if we recall another of Dr. Lee's colleague Aifen uh, suddenly spoke out in her interview and she reviewed more information about what was happening in the Wuhan Central Hospital. And, and you know, people were just puzzled. What, what was happening to Wuhan Central Hospital and the authorities, the, uh, the, the hospital administration? And I think was 
cursing as well, basically in her interview. In one, you know, her, her, what she said was also quoted and circulated widely. Um, and I think, uh, again, another of the memes from that period, I think it was that historical moment that really mattered for what people uh, talked about, what people uh, could uh, speak out about. Um, but, uh, but since it was, it was an important uh, um, statement at that point, it was you know important uh, political statement, it has been taken as a slogan since then, like I mentioned earlier on. And given a particular, I think a particularly potent force because it brings back memories of that moment, memories of people uh, like Dr. Li Wenliang who died right um, at, at that period. Uh, I think that's why in terms of the longer term impacts, um, again, I, I, uh, you know, I, I, I did not really try to even venture to, to, to talk about longer term impacts because I, I wrote the book in the first year, right? In, mostly in 2020. I was just trying to capture what was happening, what happened at that moment, and um, uh, not knowing how this whole thing was going to turn out. We still don't know. Still, there are a lot of unpredictable uh, uh, things about it. So I, I, it's hard to say. But one thing I guess we could say is we know that Li Wenliang's uh, Weibo posting has become a kind of wailing wall that people would go there on a daily basis. Many people would go and post things. And scholars in, in China and outside have written articles, some excellent articles about uh, what people posted there. It's, you know, they posted all kinds of things. It's, it's you know, it's a, it's for, for some people, it's a personal space to share their own ruminations, a quiet space for ruminations. For others, you know, they are trying to have a dialogue conversation with Dr. Lee. It's a fascinating space. I think it's a, it's a space of memory, but it's, it continues to be a space, I think for some people to cope with uh, the trauma of the memory of that period. So that, that's a longer term effect maybe. Yes, well, um, we are uh, almost out of time. We have a couple of more um, academic questions and here's one I just wanna raise. I don't know if you have an answer to it yet at this point, as you said, as this book is focused on a particular moment in time. But one member of the audience asks if you could say anything about the theories or the concept that helped inform your analysis here of these, these diaries. Um, and uh, you, you don't put the, the theory front and center in the book itself. There's no literature review. It cuts straight to the, um, the experience itself. But maybe you could say a little bit about um, what was in your mind as you um, laid out these stories in these books, in the book. Thank you, thank you, uh, Nara. Um, yeah, you know, uh, Although I focused on storytelling, of course, I have theoretical considerations and that's how I, and those considerations uh, help me to organize the material, um, especially the diaries. Um, and uh, there's a lot to say. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can say a lot. Uh, first of all, uh, I would say, and, and I try to actually touch on some of these issues in the conclusion part. And, you know, the, the three concepts that I have are kind of theoretical concepts, um, scene, character, and context. Uh, uh, theoretical context in the sense that I use scenes instead of institutions, right? We know that in China studies, when we study China, well, we, in, in social science, we, institutions are always important part of story, certainly impo important part of telling China's story. Um, but um, uh, one reason why I focused on scenes instead of um, institutions, as I mentioned early on, is I think scenes is help, uh, useful in capturing the fluidity and dynamics of, of that moment. And I, and I don't need to um, 
uh, make an argument about what are the institutional factors that determine this. Of course, we, we, we understand all things happen as a result of some conditions, you know, um, uh, some conditions shape directly or indirectly uh, this, this particular moment. But seeing it, I think, is, is a way of, um, of um, telling stories um, in a meaningful way uh, and in a theoretical, I, I hope, interesting way. And I think uh, I, I actually would argue and I try to make this point in the conclusion that uh, perhaps when we study Chinese uh, society, this concept could be used uh, more often in the sense that you know, we, we tend, we, we, we try to, we often, you know, that's our training of them as, as social scientists, scholar, we draw conclusions, we come up with theoretical explanations, um, but um, and no theory uh, holds all the truth and theories, uh, theories you know, often just fall behind reality. Reality is always complex. So I think um, a focus on, thing, on seeing will be helpful. Character is the same, and uh, although the seeing more or less, you know, it's, it's theories of drama and social social science use the concept of seeing a lot, and that borrow, and, you know, inspiration comes from that character. The concept of character mostly from literary theories. There have been a lot of um, fascinating studies of character, the concept of character in literary theory, and I borrowed uh, that. But again, I don't want to go into that context as well. For this, you know, I really pay a lot of attention to providing as much context as possible. And my uh, consideration was that, you know, we read a lot of media stories here in the US and I often feel that we don't have enough context. Um, so I don't, I, I want my readers of my book, especially uh, people who are not China scholars who don't know the context, to get a sense of the context, uh, you, know, you know, I think it will, it will be helpful to understand these individual stories. And one way in which your focus, your use of scenes, um, I thought was very useful for um, capturing the people who are caught in between and particularly thinking about that truck driver you wrote about who was from Hunan, who was stuck mm -hmm. and couldn't get <laughs> Uh, through, um, couldn't, wasn't allowed to stop anywhere. And when he was finally stopped by the police, just burst into tears. Um, and that's precisely um, the kind of scene that your book captures that a focus on institutions or something like that would miss entirely. Um, so I thought it was very, very effective. Thank you, Nara. Bill, do you want to jump in here? Uh, uh, no, I, uh, I was so fascinated by by the presentation and, 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 and by the questions that were asked, I decided to stay completely in the background. Well, I think we're out of time now. So I think we should thank um, Guobin for a wonderful presentation. I encourage everyone to um, go out and buy the book. And hopefully next year we can have you come here in person and actually sign our books for us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nara. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for all the wonderful questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. OK, so I guess it's just us now. That was a marvelous session, Nara. I hope people enjoyed it. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble because it's so sunny.